Hello people, I am Inko, and today I'll be reviewing a game that is not near and dear to me, that is not from my childhood, and I don't possess any emotional attachment to. A game where you play as a runaway male host after the nightclub shuts down due to a rebel insurgency, where the only qualifications to join a squad of fantasy paramilitaries is to be cute and funny, and where the key to victory during fights is choosing between action and inaction. The difference? Inaction has a higher success rate for you and your team. That or it breaks your game entirely. Magna Carta Phantom of the Avalanche is a game made by Softmax and released in 2001 in the city of Pyongyang for Korean audiences only. It's a game I've wanted to play but lack the ability to do so as I don't speak Korean. However, very recently the game was translated from Korean to English by a couple of people on the internet. I won't complain about the translation, someone who speaks the language can do that. But for the most part dialogue is coherent and I can understand the story. It's a game that was inspired by PS1 style JRPGs as it mostly tries to play out like one even if it does fall short of what those games had to offer. And as such, it features things such as combat, camera angles, random encounters, fashion, a lot of fashion, and not just one, but three girls wearing asymmetrical pants, and they all aim to ruin your life however they can. It's a game that's either completely your type and will love it to no end, or you'll be like me and have an extreme headache getting through it. But before we can actually play the game, we must go through the first roadblock, installing it. Now, the game is technically only supposed to run on whatever 2001 Korean operating systems they were using back then, but that's no issue, it's been made available for all of us to use. So to play the game, you'll just have to follow this install guide. Very simple, very easy. Okay, but real talk, uh, I implore you, do not do this. You have only things to lose by following this long ass guide. There's other, easier ways to play the game. As such, someone already followed the guide and packaged the game neatly into an exe for us. Thank you for your sacrifice. But is it a virus? Probably. But another piece of malware on my computer is only a drop in the bucket. Before we go on though, I must advise you to purchase an actual copy of the game. No, it's not sold by the company anymore. No, you're not going to find it at retail price. And there is no digital release of the game. But still, buy a disc. Support the company that hasn't released a video game since 2012. But alas, I am only a voice online. I can't physically interact with you just yet. So you're free to do whatever you want. There's a couple things you have to go through, settings to adjust, mods to download in order to get the game up and running. Nothing particularly complicated, just follow the instructions on the site and you should be able to play the game and even put it on whatever resolution you need. Also keep in mind you can't alt tab out of the game, or do anything that involves moving the game. It simply crashes and you have to kill it via task manager. And I do mean everything. One time while playing, my game randomly crashes after a fight. I thought, what the hell? It was a Steam message my friend sent me. What important things did he have to say to me? Sniff sniff, is that a boy? I smell, yes, I smell it, boy smell, I smell a boy, what? So yeah, don't press the windows key or anything like that. There's no fix to this, I've tried everything and no luck. I guess that's just how the game is. After you finish doing that, the game should run relatively fine, barring a couple of bugs and crashes, but I'll get to that in a minute. Also, OBS refused to capture the game, so I had to resort to other methods. It's the reason why you can see my activate windows watermark throughout the video. Apologies for that, it won't get in the way. Anyway, Magnus Carlsen was Softmax's first foray into 3D gaming, and uh, it shows. I'm kidding, it doesn't look that bad, except for when they animate. It's a game with big ambitions that was countered by a low budget after they wasted it all on the opening scene. The game starts and we see a woman. If you leave the game on during the menu, you'll be treated to some very old looking pre-renders and all things considered, they don't look all that bad, for the most part. This little video is meant to show you the scope of the game. Mysterious legions attacking our protagonist, giant cityscapes with airships, a human sacrifice? As soon we'll see though, everything shown in this cutscene is bullshit. The camera pans in and reveals it was all a dream of our leading man and top tier JRPG sad boy, Kalint, who was taking a fat nap for some reason. But now he continues his journey to his hometown of Shurelmir and uh oh, tank controls. Yeah, this is a PC RPG so we either use the arrow keys to move or move around using the mouse. Magna Carta follows him and his band of hired military mercenaries under the name of Squad 7. Squad 7 is special as their group, the Short Storm, has other squads filled mostly with nobles and important people. Squad 7 is filled with people who rose the ranks by their own skills. Uh, it's composed by only two people, Kalinch and this guy. And their squad is being sent to handle the spike in monster attacks. This takes us on a cross-country trip to see the nicer parts of the Filipino countryside. 
During this, we accidentally foiled the plans of a rebel group that seemed to be responsible for the increase in monster activity. Their goal? To bring back the country of Croes, which, according to the wiki, had a little bit of a war with Shud Elmir, wherein Shud Elmir massacred a big portion of their population, and now the survivors are either enslaved or live in terrible conditions. They basically want to get rid of the aristocracy Shud Elmir has and make everyone equal. This idea, of course, is bullshit, and Clint, not having anything else to do, gets assigned to deal with them with his band of idiots. We also have clowns to deal with, I, uh, I don't know what they do. That's the basic premise. We dick around as Squad 7 and end up stumbling onto a larger plot that may or may not involve Clint and his mommy and daddy issues. I'll get to the story in a minute, but for now let's dig into how the game itself plays. Unlike most games released out of Korea nowadays, we can play this game without worrying about bots, endless grind, or getting fleeced for all our money at every turn. However, we can still enjoy the plentiful amount of bugs that are ready for us. Magna Carta is one of those games where reading the manual first helps you understand everything about the game. Unfortunately for us, the manual is in Korean and costs around $300. So I'm thrown into my first battle after taking a few steps. I click around aimlessly and accomplish nothing. This goes on for a while until I hit a random key on my keyboard and everything dies instantly. Keep that one in mind for later. As you may have noticed, this game is a turn-based type game with random battles. Combat is quite different when compared to lesser known JRPGs that were releasing around this time. Also, yes, I know this game isn't technically a JRPG, but uh, fuck you. So, what this means is that we're no longer standing still and pressing the same command. We have to put in work. In order to attack an enemy, you have to move towards them. Once you get in range, the game obliges us to mash the spacebar to attack. But just mashing won't net you the required maximum damage since you have to mash three times in a rhythm that is unique to each character. This causes a combo and the dude attacks with more damage. In practice, this is surprisingly the only thing in the game that doesn't feel clunky and gives combat more player involvement. In theory, however, it doesn't make much sense when you do a perfect combo and your gunman or mage only hits once. It still does the extra damage, but it's unsatisfying. Once you successfully get three combos in a row, you'll enter crazy mode. Here, the mechanics get changed up. This time you have to mash the keyboard as much as you can. The game then ranks you and you either eat shit or do big damage. Or you can say nah, that shit's lame and just use a skill. Do the same amount of damage, maybe even hurt enemies around you, and ignore the button mash. But things aren't so simple. You can't just walk up to someone and whack them from across the map. Much like a sex offender, we have a limited amount of space to walk around. This is communicated to us by the blue circle around our character. Walking to our desired target takes up a turn point. If you walk too much, you'll run out of points, which is something we want to avoid since those same points are needed to initiate an attack or use a skill. So combat will boil down to tapping very lightly so your character takes the smallest steps possible in order to reach the enemy, or rather until the orange circle touches them. Though most of the time the fight will start, the enemy will waste all their turn points walking towards you and you'll be close enough to hit them with the naked lightning man. For the entirety of the game, you'll ever only have 3 turn points. There's no way to get more, so you better be thankful that the game even gives you that many. But there is a way to increase the range of what you can walk. Increasing this range means that turn points don't go away so quickly when walking. I don't know how true this is since evidence is inconclusive, but I like to think otherwise. We can do this through the Carta system. While all the mechanics I explained above are technically told to you through an old man that you can miss, what about how to properly level up? Yeah, no, figure that out on your own. Instead of gaining XP like the traditional way, we gain Carta for each element. Elements can range from shit, fire, or more abstract concepts such as tornado and shuriken. From that, we can swap cartas around to the specific body part. Each carta scales differently depending on what body part you choose. In general, you're going to want to fit a character with carta that you can still put points into, but also scales closely to how your stats were previously. Also, you share carta between all your 7 party members, meaning that you have to evenly distribute them amongst your party. But you may ask, what do each of these stats do? Not to worry, I had the same question. It's quite simple really. HP, self-explanatory. Intelligence is for magic. Strength increases the damage of your attacks. Defense, self-explanatory. And dexterity, which makes your blue circle even bigger. Figuring out what card works best for the character is vital. Pick the wrong one and you'll do next to no damage. In all honesty, trying to min-max card and swapping stuff around to make numbers go higher made my brain feel good. Your ability to hold Carta is defined by your equipment, which in a way, getting better equipment is how you level up. Basically, new equipment raises the Carta limit and you're free to do whatever you want. This seems like a good time to mention, uh, there is no money in this game. You don't earn anything other than Carta in fights. So likewise, there's no shop to buy gear or even anything to heal yourself. Equipment is found through little chests around dungeons or in the overworld. I'm told the good shit is hidden in areas you're not supposed to go to. I don't know how true this is. I ventured far into the map and only came back with a duplicate item. Now, take the last minutes of video and shove them up your ass. All of that is worthless. I've wasted your time, and in turn, I've also wasted my time writing and editing it. Why am I sabotaging myself? 
Well, because when I first started playing the game, I was pressing random keys on my keyboard to see what worked, and I happened to press the number 9 key. This uh, instantly kills everything in the fight. I literally don't know why it does that. Everything dies. Random enemies, mini bosses, story bosses, the goddamn final boss itself. I've checked the wiki, nothing explains why this exists. There's no downsides to using it either. You get the same amount of karma anyway, so shit, why not use it all the time? Either way, I sort of vibe with the combat, but also not really. In general, I do like turn-based games that incorporate movement into their mechanics, but this is essentially the bare minimum. Movement and positioning don't really do anything in terms of strategy. I either move away and the enemy never hits me, or we just keep whacking each other until one of us drops. If we perhaps had more than three turn points, then there could be more opportunities to solve problems. Or even a way to target different enemies, since, well, that's something that's not included in the game. Ultimately, moving around is just used to make fights even longer than they already are meaning that the majority of the fights are incredibly long. This usually isn't a problem. I'll just sit back and put on my favorite podcast and I'll be just fine. This becomes an issue when uh, you have to do these long ass fights every couple of steps, which in retrospect is probably why the game features an instant win button. Much later in the game, I do feel combat gets a bit wider because of how many different abilities you get since they open more possibilities of play. But these kinds of abilities are introduced far too late. Though combat isn't the worst part of the game and it wouldn't be that much of an issue if it weren't for other problems amplifying it. When I think of the very best JRPGs have to offer, they are usually accompanied by some great sites. Maybe even explore towns and see what NPCs have to say. In Magna Carta, we have uh, one town. It's only four corridors long and there's at least seven NPCs spread throughout the world. So the basic structure of the game is watch a cutscene, walk around, fight. Repeat for a couple of hours and you have a full game. Normally, this is how most games go. So, why am I citing this as a complaint? Well, you have to traverse the same parts of the map multiple times doing nothing but walking forward and doing fights. None of the chapters change this loop. Naturally, this gets pretty boring, which is why I say combat makes me feel pain. Not because it's inherently terrible, flaws aside, but rather because there's really nothing else to do except combat. You have one town to explore, which is the starting town. Dungeons don't break away from this format either. Instead, they are even more linear and the camera constantly changes orientation making you wonder where the hell you're going, only for you to then be interrupted by a fight that lasts 15 minutes. Then after you finish, the camera has changed positions yet again. But wait, now the game has soft locked itself by not activating the cutscenes or just not letting you into a room. There's also no side quest either. The closest thing we have is talking to an NPC three times until they give you a key to get you to leave them alone. The overworld is not exactly explorable. Exploration is usually very limited in narrow corridors. So yeah, it's not great, but like all JRPGs, people tend to forgive the shittiness if the story is good. So is that the case with Magna Carta? Is the story good enough to pull its own weight? Let's go. The story is overall very strangely made. It has a fairly likable cast of characters as well as some strong themes throughout. Let's take Kalins for example. Kalins has mommy issues due to the fact that his mom died in childbirth. Then comes the mysterious Estelle that Kalins ends up projecting onto and thinking she's mommy. And you know what, me too. Then comes another mysterious girl in the form of Adora, who he ends up falling in love with because she reminds him of Estelle, who he also liked but in an orphan way. I, I don't really know what to call that, but you know, it's, it's there. All of which is explored through a bunch of cutscenes wherein Kalins either yells, berates, or admonishes her for acting silly, but also sitting down with her and having an intimate conversation with. Kalins is one of those characters I grew to like, even though I didn't really hate him that much at the start, he just made me laugh. He's such a dick to everyone, like imagine Squall but now imagine him being an asshole. But it's understandable as we later find out. Kalins got fired from the job he didn't like and now he has to work a job he likes even less. So yeah, cut him some slack. But later on through the characters, Adora mainly, he loses a bit of that assholeness and becomes an actual character. Though he doesn't lose it completely as he's still fed up with shit. But later on you can see he still regrets being a dick to Adora even though he's still acting like one. Then we have our quintessential magical girl Chelsea and our brute Rothma. Their interactions with each other essentially boil down to them throwing insults and fighting. It's always pretty funny when it happens, but also through their interactions you can tell they sort of like each other. When Rothma is going through shit, it's her that's most concerned. The story tries to be funny a lot, and sometimes it works, other times it's like one of the main villains showing off their brainwashed girl. Then she orders her to turn Kalint into a man. And then this happens and everyone just stays quiet for a while. Even the other bad guys like, yo, what the fuck? Throughout the game, the idea of nobility and commoners constantly brought up. Hell, one of the first long cutscenes is about the characters discussing their social status. Kalins being an adopted noble next in line for the throne. Chelsea also being adopted into a noble family as a teenager. And Rothma being a lowly poor. 
and then the main villains being very strongly against the idea of nobles and rich people. We see this idea through things such as this fat ass basically embodying everything wrong that comes with inheriting a noble status. Or the biggest example being when the main villains start turning a bunch of villagers into monsters. Then the monsters start killing people, so the higher ups just decide to wall the town off thus trapping the villagers in. The reason being nobody wanted to risk their lives for a couple of commoners. Unfortunately for us, those commoners happen to be related to one of our party members. Either way, this more or less shows how some people's lives are considered less important. Which is why it's so disappointing when this idea gets dropped near the end in favor for shape-shifting memory rewriting, imposters among us, fake people bracelets. The goals of the bad guys also don't get addressed either, as in they want Shooter Mir to stop being oppressive. Maybe they do get addressed, I don't know, the ending was in Korean without subtitles. Uh, yeah, no, the story isn't particularly good. There was some stuff I liked, such as the characters, but ultimately everything comes together in a way that's just not very good. Let's start with the world. Typically, when games want you to believe the world is larger than it is, they do it through abstractions. A world map where you travel very long distances, but not really. Or they are separated by zones, thus giving the feel that the world is quite large. Magna Carta's world is small, very secluded and barren but the game still wants us to believe we're in a huge continent with multiple countries. Characters will often talk about these grand wars and how the main villain wants to unify the continent or some shit. The thing is, we never see any part of the world that the characters talk about. So when the main villain threatens to destroy the world, I'm like, yeah, sure, dude, go ahead. Like, what is this place supposed to be? How far are we from the starting town? The way everything is structured, any lore or information dump, and there's a bunch of that, falls flat. This information doesn't apply to anything because there's nothing to see, nothing to explore, it all feels very lifeless. Not to mention the lifelessness is amplified when none of the events that happen in the story directly affect the world. The NPCs don't change their dialogue, there's no new people to talk to, and environments we frequently travel to remain sunny and full of joy. Everything just stays the same. Then we get to the narrative itself, and while I did enjoy the characters, I gotta say the main story is just not very good. It feels pretty rushed, and it's not even badly paced, the story is just not paced at all. Shit just keeps happening and it never stops. Characters will have long conversations where they spill their innermost secrets and 5 minutes later the story has completely moved on and we're getting assigned to a new mission. There was one chapter where the story was seemingly about to slow down when Kalins got assigned to be security at a party. I was like, yeah I know how this shit goes, we're gonna walk around, talk to people, see some new sides to the characters. Yeah, no, it was an hour long cutscene, and as soon as you got there Kalins got berated, insulted, and then the enemies attacked. Overall, I think this story is the least terrible part of the game. It definitely has its positives and some enjoyable parts, but its unconvincing world building and its non-stop rapid pace bring it way down. As a whole though, the game is just kind of a mess. Like they tried to do way more than they could and ended up shitting the bed instead. This can probably be blamed on the fact that Softmax tried to make the entire game in one year. This didn't work and the game was so buggy it got recalled, earning it the name Bunga Carta. So this shitty version is actually the new and improved edition. Then whoever was in charge of the game got fired even though they had written huge amounts of lore. Lore which you can still read if you want to know how ambitious this game was. Stuff that ultimately never made it into the game. So like Magna Carta, it's not very good, which is a shame. I was excited for it since it has that nice graphic style that seems to be popular with the indie crowd nowadays. But really, it's not the worst JRPG I've played. Rather, the game just ends up being aggressively mediocre with a combat system that can range from alright to brain dead. Actual brain dead level design and a story with more lows than highs. But you should still play it. Why? Because a bunch of dudes came together to translate this garbage. Another came to make sure it actually ran on your computer, then someone else came along and made it easier than ever to run. All for a mediocre silly game that got recalled and apparently it's considered by some to be the reason why Korean single player games died out. It killed the whole genre. And despite all that, it's still here thanks to those fine people. And that's quite beautiful to me. So play it you might somehow unironically enjoy it. Anyways, that's all the nut I've got to give today. Do the thing with the like and subscribe. Thank you all for watching. More videos coming soon, and that's about it. See ya. Check it out, I'm in the house like carpet. And if there's too many heads in my blunt, I won't spark it. I'll put it in my pocket and save it like rocket fuel. Till everybody's gone and it's cool, then I spark it up with my brother. His mama named him Moan, but I call him Moan Lover And he's more than a cover, he's a quill We're putting shit together like the house that John built on a hill Cause this shit gonna feel like velvet turtle My style fits tighter than a girl